So Dr. Afkin, uh, welcome as we talk about competencies for uh, PTs and go ahead and begin, uh, begin our discussion for us today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'd say I'm delighted to be asked to come talk on this topic, but this is a, you know, admittedly a pretty dry, deadly topic. Um, I had never done a presentation on this topic until last year when my OT colleagues started uh, publishing on competencies. And all of a sudden I'm getting asked to, you know, balance the presentations. So uh, last year in Texas, I, I did something on competencies. Um, and I'm now here doing something on competencies. My history on competencies are very, very long. This is not some new topic I shall present on it. Back in the late 80s, I had a lot of federal funding for post-professional training of therapist, uh, pediatric physical therapist. And what, one of the things you do when you have federal money is you're supposed to have, what are you gonna achieve? What's the outcomes? Well, that's where the competencies come from. What competencies do we want? And one of our grants for PT, OT, speech, and special ed was very specific. You have to have these performance uh, competencies, write them up, we did, and that was the first draft, and there have been other publications from that. So it, there's a, a history to this. Um, it, it, you know, we, um, you don't do continuing it on this topic very often, but now that we're looking at performance appraisal, um, and I've done some work in Florida, which I'll allude to, um, that makes it critical that you as therapists in the schools really start thinking about how is your performance going to be um, reviewed? Is it the reading scores in the school? And there's a system in Florida, the school scores went up, every person in that school got a raise. Well, the therapists didn't feel very good about that. They knew they didn't have much to do with reading scores. On the other hand, the scores went down and they, you know, are not gonna get a, a raise or a bonus or whatever for decades because some of the schools, as you well know, um, are historically underachieving. So we've got to start looking at ways to advocate for ourselves with regard to performance appraisal. And now this topic is more important. It was in one of the federal laws, one of the education acts, performance appraisals for teachers and school employees. So it's something that um, it's becoming much more important. I'm going to review briefly the competencies that we've developed and talk about them, but not in a lot of detail, because I want the second half of this talk to be more about, okay, where are your weaknesses? How are you going to correct your weaknesses? How are you going to grow as a professional? And that's what I want to really focus in on is your individual plans and where you need to go. So I'm going to push share screen. Oh, I would always end up with more than I need. Okay, now, do you see this? Could someone, Deb, can you? We you, do, yes. You do. Okay, and here I am. Okay, so here we are. Um, I, by the way, am, have re just retired from the University of Kentucky. Um, I was previously, with all of this work on competencies, was done at Drexel University. Uh, Hahnemann University was a previous name of that group. So that's where all, mo much of my career was spent until um, poor old Hahnemann went bankrupt as a university and I ended up in Hong Kong and then Kentucky. So that's that's where it all originally started. I am the author of Meeting the PT Needs of Children and a Medbridge series on school-based practice. I'm supposed to do these disclosures. Um, and I'm coordinator of a national conference on innovation and school-based practice for the APTA. We were in Oregon just a few years ago. So hopefully maybe some of you attended that conference. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good conference to, to get a, a handle and a grip on school-based practice for those of you new to the field. I do have objectives for this session and my main objective is that you start to develop your own plan for professional development. Um, being a PT is a continuum of lifelong learning. I, please don't be like a PT once come up and told me, I don't need continuing ed. I graduated from the University of Kentucky 25 years ago. She was fighting that we shouldn't have requirements for continuing education because she learned everything she needed to know. Well, A, I know we don't learn pediatrics in PT school. I don't care where you went, you didn't learn very much. B, in 25 years, things change, and I certainly hope you're changing. I know I'm changing. I'm still catching up on things. Two slides later, you'll see my, my latest learning experience. Um, 
we need to continue learning and it's lifelong and just put that in your plan, uh, put your money aside for continuing education. Your state is obviously doing an excellent job of providing experiences for you and, and um, that's wonderful. So think about lifelong learning. Uh, in PT school, the best schools in the country provide maybe three courses and a clinical affiliation. The worst provide no courses. They just call everything a lifespan approach so they get away with that. Um, so depending on where you went to your university training, you got little or next to nothing in PT, uh, pediatric PT. You then did hopefully a clinical experience. You get a residency. Wonderful. You then go find somewhere along the way, maybe after a lot of jobs, you end up in schools. That's where most of your learning takes place on the job training. And if you know much about on the job training, in many situations, it's not the best training possible. So maybe you go and try to get your pediatric clinical specialization certification. Excellent. A way to prove to others that you actually know something more than orthopedics. Um, you may go and get an advanced degree. These competencies that I worked on, by the way, were all for post-professional programs. We used to have, you'd become a PT at a bachelor's level, then you'd go and get your post-professional master's degree in orthopedics, pediatrics, whatever. Those were outstanding year to two year long programs, concentrated much, much more rigorous than the residencies. We don't have that anymore. And as a director of a PhD program, I can tell you PhD programs are for researchers. We are training you to do research. So you're not gonna get it there either. Whatever topic you research of the vestibular system, you'll learn one heck of a lot about that, but not the breadth of PT practice, which gets us back to the pediatric practice, gets us back to the clinical specialization, which does cover everything. You then are gonna maintain your clinical skills, I hope you're gonna, uh, uh, keep going on, and then you're going to assume some sort of leadership role. So lifelong continuum that I hope you follow um, in your career. Um, I want to comment on quality indicators. Our OTs in the 2019 came up with, oh, quality indicators. And I'm there, oops, how do they differ from competency? So I went to their publication. And what are quality indicators, but a set of explicit and technical competencies? OK, so they're basically the same thing. Now, some quality indicators may have more explicit details, some competencies may have more details instead of these generic statements, but basically the same thing. It's more uh, language and, and um, how one talks, one's use of um, language. And that gets us to this particular slide. You had a um, course a few weeks ago, quality indicators for school physical therapist. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think there's a myriad uh, of tools to articulate the value of our services. There's not that many tools looking at our services. In fact, I think very few. However, I completely agree with their statement. However, measurement sometimes measuring, however, measuring sometimes immeasurable phenomena in programs can be challenging. I absolutely agree with that. And only an OT or a speech pathologist would say measuring immeasurable phenomena in programs. And I can't see you, but hopefully someone gets a chuckle out of that. We are different. We are different in how we write and how we do some things. And our OT colleagues are beautiful with language. And I love this immeasurable phenomena in programs can be challenging. Absolutely agree. Um, you would never see all this writing from a PT, uh, just an aside. I directed this PhD program for PTs, OTs, and speech and language pathologists. The applications would come in. This is in 2000, and my secretary would come in. Oh, I think we have three OT applicants, two PTs, and 10 SLPs based on the weight of the application, the number of words and pages they added to the story. Um, so, you know, PTs tend to be much more concise, and, and I'll just leave it at that, um, and, and doesn't mean good or bad, but uh, some of you, I, don't, I can't see many of you, so I don't know if we, there are many of you that are older. I'm going to quickly go through this. No, you're, oh, you're a pretty young group. Um, I'm see, older. Are, are one, one's older. Okay, older person. Do you remember what the definition of physical therapy was in 1975 when they put the law through? I when actually you, don't know. Okay. Well, it was treatment of atrophied muscles. That's what a physical therapist oh. does. 
okay, treatment of atrophied muscles, and OT was services by a licensed occupational therapist. And that's how I got involved in all of this is I was at a CSM meeting, the hearings were the following week in Atlanta, I lived in Atlanta, Susan, you're presenting. So here I am this real novice PT, but I'm going to do the presentations for the National Association. And we said, you know, this OT definition is really good. We'll go with it because the PT definitions across the country were very heavily focused on modalities. Well, PT service used very little modalities. We didn't want a list of modalities. So we went with that definition. Our OTs, on the other hand, came up with three paragraphs of a definition of an OT. So in the federal laws, OTs has three paragraphs. We have this line that we're licensed very important to us because it saved our, our butts in many cases as states wanted to use unlicensed movement specialist movement therapist. So it's worked out for the best, but uh, from the very beginning, we, we showed how we are similar and different perhaps. So school therapists, what do you learn? You learn on the job. There are a few tools to measure and articulate our distinct value. And our OTs uh, commented that we're frequently evaluated as teachers and we are, which is not consistent with our scope of practice. Uh, this is the latest publication on these competencies. It was grant funded. However, the APTA Academy of Pediatric PT produced uh, a, had a task force and produced performance appraisal of PT linked to student outcomes. And they've basically taken these competencies, and I'll show you in a few minutes, came up with the plans of how you could achieve these competencies. The only thing they changed is they, they didn't want much focus on research. I still think you need to be able to read and understand research, and I think it's important, but that's the only item they really change. So uh, we could post this fact sheet for you. It's available to non-members. All fact sheets are available to non-members. Very well done, and there's been a history of uh, us producing some of these to help therapists out in the field. So here's this publication. I'm gonna review the major headings. I'm not gonna read all of the, these statements. You can read them, but you can get a gist of how comprehensive they are. So what about that context of schools? Where do we fall in the organizational structure? Uh, tends to be at the bottom, um, but okay, that's where we are. Um, do we understand the curriculum, how we fit into the curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. Do we know our federal, state, and local laws? Absolutely critical to anyone working in the schools. Um, I can give you an example of a therapist that said she was going to be fired if she didn't provide services to this child. And in this state, they require a referral. Well, if you don't have a referral to treat in a state that requires it, I know Oregon, you, you, you don't require it initially, um, she could lose her license, which is more important, keeping your license or losing a job that's temporary. And trying to explain that to administrators and administrators of yeah, the public law says you must serve this child. Yes, it does. My license says I need a referral. So you have to understand the nuances of the law to, in order to protect yourself, protect your license, and appropriately serve children. A comment on that, um, Oregon is exemplary in terms of its State Practice Act. A number of years ago, you had a group, and I can't remember the woman's name because she, she worked with us on our, our conference in Portland on getting the rules and regulations changed to reflect school practice. In most states, every 30 days, you must be to a comprehensive reevaluation. Well, in a school, if you only see a child every 30 days, that comprehensive reevaluation is not appropriate. So Oregon went through step by step, and, and we use it as the example for other states looking at changing their laws, just so you know that I do know that and um, you've done a great job. Um, you, you need to apply, uh, well, this is your knowledge and skills and understand other professions. Of course, this is all a team approach. Everything is team-based and you have to be able to exchange and talk to your colleagues. Uh, you, you need to be able to assist the student in, in accessing their community. You know when the law was reauthorized in 95, they added all these community service activities and same in 2004, that part of the IEP should include being engaged in certain community extracurricular activities. So hopefully you're seeing an increase in the number of recreation and community IEP goals, because that's now part of the law to be looking at that more carefully of course, including the family. Um, 
So what about, does the student get services? Who makes that decision? Um, and and I, I, there's too many, there's a lot of answers to that. So we'll stay with it, it's the IEP team. But what I wanna ask my PTs is how much services do you decide on? Any, any comments on that? How do you decide how much services? Feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat box. Chris, I see you're unmuted. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm wondering if nobody's answering right away because there's no there's no method. Um, you know, at, at one point I remember having a um, sheet that we got probably from a ties conference that helped to evaluate things like you a student might not need that much service, but then all of a sudden they go from elementary to middle school, and then it's a whole new staff. So all of a sudden the PT might have even been off their services, and then you have to look at that kid again because the staff in the building and the situation is all new. Um, so I think that there's never one set determination for a kid. You have to look at their situation, you know, could be surgeries that come up or changes in their, um, what's happening with their diagnosis. Uh, anyway, so I think you just have to really know the student and I don't have any tool that I use that I feel like uh, can measure all those nuances. Yeah. And, and there is no one tool. And of course, it has to be individualized. But, you know, lots of school systems, never more than once a week. Well, why not? It's not never. It's on occasion, maybe not all the time. Um, there is a, a handout, a fact sheet from the Academy of Pediatric PT that looks at this uh, 20, 30 years ago, Iowa did a brilliant job in coming up with guidelines, not rules. Um, then we've looked at that, and now we have a, a fact sheet that looks at it based on what they did at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for inpatient hospital care for children. Not just a guideline, but it's still not evidence-based because there is no evidence. We have no data. And remember, everything we do is supposed to be based on peer-reviewed research. And there is none. So it's not like you're missing it. There is none. There is the guideline, and I would send you to it for overall guidelines. And it talks about things like you said, changing schools, big flag, transition. You may not have seen the child for 20 years, not 20 years, um, 15 years. Uh, then they're, they're now transitioning. Well, maybe now they need PT again, and we're not at the table we should be. And, and I would always encourage you at puberty and at transition to try to see children again that you haven't been following, perhaps. Um, but we, we need to be looking at that. It's an area where research is desperately needed. Um, who do you go to with problems? Do you have a hierarchy? Do you know your hierarchy? Do you? Anyone want to comment? <laughs> Not the time and place to comment. <laughs> okay, but how, who do you go to? Okay, and are they sensitive to the needs of physical therapist? What resources are available? Do you have the resources you need? Now, with all of the money coming to schools, hopefully you can start getting some things you put on the back burner for a few years. Um, I'm going to tell you pulse oximeters and blood pressure cuffs should be the first thing I think therapists should be ordering in schools now, because I'll be talking more about the effects of COVID, not COVID, not even having COVID, but just being homeschooled and, and not being in the environment where you're exercising, you're moving, and we have solid hard data on the negative effects on typically developing children and children with disabilities. So that's one of the things I think every therapist should be carefully looking at and advocating for. So, and there are, there's resources now, and I'm not talking, those aren't expensive pieces of, equip, of equipment, but just something to think about. Um, wellness and prevention, I already got to mention this already because I think it's so important. Are you screening? Are you screening every child with a disability right now for their fitness levels, their O2 saturation levels, endurance levels? If you don't have the endurance for a school day, how are you going to learn? And I know the focus of school is partially learning, but of course, you know, the law says and functional skills, not just academics, it's academics and functional skills. Are they performing? Can they perform? And it's well within your, your um, scope of practice to be working on those endurance issues. Um, 
And I know you had a talk last month on long COVID. I went and listened to that. Very helpful. Um, you know, sure, we don't have lots of guidelines yet, but if the child has had COVID and they're not performing at the level they were before, what are we doing? Are we going back to those kids we may have served before to see if they're having any long-term effects because they had COVID or because they just sat home and in their wheelchair for the next year and a half. So something to be really looking at and focusing on right now, given our situation. Are we concerned with safety? Um, uh, what is it? Child neglect and abuse. Um, I, lost, I just lost the word. Um, Trauma-informed care is the big term right now. Are you uh, recognizing the traumas that some children are going through, especially having been at home for a certain length of time, may not have been best for the child. So wellness in schools, are you part of early intervening services or multi-tiered system of supports? I know you had a lecture on that in September. Um, is PT involved in every one of those levels? someone. What level do you focus on the most? Multi-tiered levels of support. We do all this in our school district. Okay. That's from Chris. And so, across the state, we're going to see big variances here. Okay. Some people are doing what we call MTSS. Some people might be doing it, not calling it that. But for the most part, what would you say? Aaron, what would you say? Well, I'm not doing any of it. I'm just supporting people. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. I would say I'm in, in my region. Um, I don't know that a lot of therapists are supporting on multiple levels, just mostly directly with the child and support staff in, on an individual basis. Nationwide, we tend to be at the top, the little top of that triangle, seeing tier three. And a lot of PTs don't even want to do one and two, which is more screening, more, more teamwork. Um, but we have to be, and especially when it comes to this, these endurance and fitness issues, we've got to be at the bottom screening across the board, seeing those kids <laughs> and doing more of it. I'm not saying that we're going to spend a lot of time there, but we need to look at all three levels. And I'm glad some of your systems you are. Uh, that's great. And, um, and Kelly, tell, Kelly tells us that they're using MTSS in early childhood special ed. Okay, good. We need to be, and we need to be there. But they're using it, but our PT is involved and we need to be. What about us uh, school buses? Uh, a lot of you, you get on the buses, you know what the buses are like, you know about how to evacuate buses and you're working with the kids. Oops. Well, just Could something- you ask that again? What about working on school buses and transportation for the students? I, I feel like our district does that. I mean, it's part of full access. So we, yeah, we bus all our kids to everything, field trips. I, I meet with the um, bus drivers who are helping the paraeducators get kids on and off the bus. Um, you know, we work on the specific seatbelt systems they have. And is that what you're yes, asking? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a, yeah. And an emergency evacuation plans. I'm thrilled to hear that because a lot of systems, it's therapists never stepped on the bus. Um, yeah. And that's, it's sad because there are safety issues and we have very little data on bus safety, bus accidents. Uh, Sue uh, Sh Sh Trump, who's an occupational therapist speaks at our um, innovations conference and she's the nation's leading expert at the moment on school safety regarding a PTOT roles and responsibilities. And I just learned this year from her, the reason we have no hard data is because when a family sues a system, they usually settle out of court because it, it's very quickly apparent that the school did not follow maybe even their own rules and regulations or they didn't even have any plans and procedures and if a child is injured and it goes to court you're talking about an enormous loss for a school system um and so we don't have hard data because there are uh, gag orders after you settle for whatever you settled for, you're not allowed to say anything. So there's not good data on how common uh, 
children are injured on buses or children with disabilities are injured on buses. And it probably won't be because I, I can see school systems continuing to just pay out to avoid the publicity and losses that would come from a full blown court case. So just something we should be involved when is the safety procedures, evacuation procedures, um, evacuation, of course, maintaining the safety of the person doing the evacuating. Again, all that low back stuff we're, we're knowledgeable in. Team collaboration, it goes unsaid. I'm really not going to elaborate on too much of that because we absolutely are part of a team. We have to function as a consultant and work with that team. We have to educate personnel and develop resources. Um, we have to supervise personnel and students and, and a comment on student clinical affiliations. You can't complain that there's not enough pediatric therapists available if you don't have a student program where you're starting to train those students. Uh, that is absolutely the best way to recruit personnel. And by the way, they've given one, two, three months of free service uh, at your facility. It, they've gotten oriented um, it's a great way of recruiting and helping the profession, helping children. So I, I hope you have a, a good program. Uh, we need to serve as advocates. A comment on the difference um, in advocacy, it, it's something, uh, so if you know me, you know that's been my life history, is working on advocacy issues. I have a slide that I didn't include, and I probably should have, of since 1977, the number of PTs, OTs, and speech therapists working in schools. When the law went into effect, there were a good number of speech therapists. There were hardly any PTs and OTs. And over the years, speech has had a steady increase, but not exorbitant. PT has gone up a little, still only about eight or 9,000. And OT has skyrocketed, and I think it's 24,000. Why? And please don't tell me it's all handwriting. Um, and it may be sensory processing, but I think they've done a much better job of advocating for themselves and their students than we have. And it's something we've got to be looking at. Now that there's no longer a shortage of physical therapists, we can get people in there, but we have to get them trained to be working in the school. So just as an aside, we, we've got to do a, a better job for ourselves. Um, do you know all your team players in your schools? How quickly can you get services for a student? Think about that. I don't need all your answers, but you know, you haven't been seeing a child for, for PT at all for years. All of a sudden, someone tells you, oh, Johnny, when he gets to the cafeteria, he walks there, he's out of breath, he has to sit, and he doesn't even eat because he's so exhausted. How long does it take you to get on to that student's um, IEP? And I know it's going to vary system by system, but can you get the services the students need, and how well are you working together? Just things to think about. Um, examination and, and evaluation. Again, it, this goes unsaid. This is what you're doing. Um, you're identifying strengths and needs. You're uh, collaborative to determine what needs to be done. Um, you're uh, looking at uh, uh, functional activities and naturalistic observations, absolutely natural environments. Um, I did two studies over a number of years looking at where PTs want to um, evaluate children. They still want to, PTs in schools, they still want to do it in a special room. Nah, naturalistic observation. Remember, we're following the ICF model. We're looking at participation. You don't participate in a room by yourself. You've got to include that naturalistic observation. Uh, functional abilities, you know you have to be doing all of that. Um, are you utilizing reliable cost of effective non-discriminatory instruments? I hope so. Um, and so, okay. Uh, and, and a question to you, you can't determine outcomes if you don't have an accurate examination. Um, you have to have accurate measurement tools, wrong assessments lead to ineffective intervention selection. And again, to my latest little pet issue is that screening for endurance and fitness post pandemic. If a child is sleeping throughout their lessons, they're not learning. And how can we help them with that? And there's lots of things we could be doing. Um, okay, so what about planning? You need to participate in the development of the IEP. That goes unsaid. It's just so important. I, 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 hopefully it's not an issue in your state. Um, 
your what are you going to be doing specific intervention and methods and strategies are not required in the IEP okay you know that but determination of frequency and intensity and duration is required is there data on that we just discussed almost no data on what the frequency intensity and duration should be sad but true um specific interventions need not be included thank goodness because if we only had a list um evidence-based peer-reviewed interventions what interventions could we do in schools today if that's all we were allowed to do come on group where is the evidence what interventions can we do based solely on the amount of evidence I can't call probably. on you. That's not fair. Yes, Chris. <laughs> probably nothing. Oh, there's something. Erin, <laughs> I know you. I'm going to call on you. What can we do in the schools? Therapeutic exercise. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. In the broadest sense. Anything specific? Okay. Strength. The data is there. Improving. In, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go what? ahead. Well, improving strength. We can do gait training, uh, therapeutic activities, which is hard to define in schools. <laughs> and strength training, the research is not that strong. We can improve strength, but the correlation between strength training and function is still weak. Three studies, maybe. Um, what we can definitely do is constraint-induced movement therapy and not doesn't have to be the full-blown thing, but even uh, modified programs work, and we can be doing that in schools, uh, staying with partial body weight supported treadmill training. And I'm not saying that's what you should be doing, but I'm telling you that's that's where the evidence is. So there's not a lot of evidence, and if they should change it from uh, based on peer-reviewed research when practicable, they just have to get uh, eliminate when practicable and just say based on peer reviewed research or evidence based practice, which is the term the Department of Ed is moving to, um, we're in deep trouble. So just bear that in mind as you select your interventions is where is the evidence? Lots of systematic reviews coming out and you could keep reading them. Um, I advocate to read them and that'll be part of the plan. I'm, I'm looking at my clock. Um, so something to think about. Um, Hey, are you at the table to help maximize student services and outcomes? And I don't mean just at the IEP meeting, but are you always there? Are you available? Has Zoom helped? Now, hopefully you can meet more easily with teams. Um, I would still advocate for meeting in person. It, it, relationships are important, but um, are you there? Do you know the players? Are you advocating for more staff as appropriate? I think PTs are notorious for saying, oh, I'll take on another one. Maybe you can't take on another case. How can you get more staff? There are more therapists now available in the field. And if we spent more time training them, we'll have even more people. But how can we get more staff? Are you using PTAs? I know PTAs are part of your practice act uh, are included clearly there in the schools, but I don't know how common they're used in your settings, but certainly the therapy extenders that should be considered. What about those interventions? And I, I went over that adaptive equipment, um, various methods, uh, promoting acquisition fluency, generalization, all too often we forget generalization. And I can tell you in the PT count study, which was a large nationwide study that that I did at the end of my career in work, working in, in Kentucky, um, very few goals on generalization for therapists from across the country on these 300 children. Um, just walk in a school hallway is not functional. You have to be able to walk on the playground. You have to be able to walk on those surfaces in the, in the, in the playground, go to the football field, go out to the mall. The goal of the law is to be able to live independently. How can you live independently? And that's why generalization is critical. But we did not in this nationwide survey find much of anyone doing generalization. Um, Embedding therapy intervention into daily routines. Again, PTs weren't treating in the context of the setting. And we have hard data on that showing that 
we like to do things separately. Now, not in a therapy room. They weren't doing that. They were doing an empty hallway, an empty playground, in the gym. Why can't we be doing more of our interventions with students? And, and that's a big issue. Um, are your interventions part of your daily routines? Any thoughts on that? Okay. How are you measured if they're part of daily routines? So we use something called a factor. Um, it's functional access and um, assessment of participation basically is what it is. And we modify the original factor manual for participation in PE and recess and work with teachers and kids Great. in PE and recess. And um, I actually feel like it solves the whole issue of generalization because that's where I'm, I'm constantly in class or doing something with kids that's part of the school day. Um, and it's measurable. Yeah. And yeah. Great. That's what needs to be done because we need the data. We need to show that what we're do what we're doing as a team, as a group works and that an intervention is working um, and that it should be embedded. And that's part of that very first statement about um, immeasurable phenomena. I forgot the words already. Um, it's really hard to measure, but at least or measure if your work meant something. But if the child achieves the goals, they're participating in X and Y, that's the most important. Um, how your performance appraisal will go is another issue. Um, you know to document, um, you know, you know all that. You, you have to do it. Um, I, I'm big on what didn't work because I used I fill in a lot or I used to fill in a lot. And I, you know, okay, I'm here now. What worked? What didn't work? Did you try this? Did you use? Did you get a brace and it didn't work? Did you try this type of walker? I want to know what didn't work and in the documents. Um, and you know all that. Administration in schools, are we moving up into administration, becoming leaders? Um, not many therapists have leadership roles in schools across the country, unfortunately. Um, are you a manager? And there was a things to consider. Um, happy, efficient staff influences student outcomes. There's been a lot of studies on that. So if people are happy in the workplace, teachers are happy, better outcomes. Um, are you advocating for yourself and your students? Research, as I mentioned, this is the PT count symbol. If you've seen that before, that that's our, our nationwide study. Uh, you have to be able to read the literature to provide evidence-based practice. You don't have to do the research, but you have to be able to read it. Uh, you have to be able to apply it and justify it for why you're doing it um, and partake in program evaluation, clinical research activities. And at a minimum, support research efforts of others. You know, uh, if you're a member of the APTA you get from the PEDS group at the end of the milestones these survey students are doing. Well, fill out the survey, it's 10 minutes. Um, can you provide subjects for, for, for research that's going on? Are you participating in journal clubs? Ways that you can help the research agenda of others so that you have the data you're gonna need when they say everything must be evidence-based. Not there yet, but we're getting there and we have to be, be ready for reimbursement is based on, on the research. Um, and providing interventions not supported by the literature is a waste of student time and cost to the community. I spent years giving uh, workshops talking about evidence-based practice and passive range of motion. All these people doing passive range of motion. No data whatsoever to support it. It's taken years to get people away from it. Um, just making an assumption, you're not doing it, except in some very specific cases, active range of motion, whole different story. Um, and a comment, student participation in research can lead to better outcomes, interventions, and engagement in the community. In PT counts, I was doing a site visit for reliability, and the Therapist tells me the principal here has a child, a grandchild with severe problems in another school and is part of the study. And I'm going to make sure I introduce you on there. I have to go meet the principal. Okay, I'll go meet the principal. Why? That principal was so thrilled that his grandchild was asked to be part of a study. No one had ever asked that child to participate in anything. Profound disabilities, 
but he was being asked to contribute to the science of serving students with disabilities. And that principal and the child's parents was absolutely thrilled that that child can engage in that study. And I don't think we think of that often about the child's side of it and the family side of participating because the research we do is non-invasive. There, there's almost nothing a PT does that's invasive. Maybe the stuff that they're doing now with, you know, a, flu, a blood flow in your extremities and the ice in the extremities, the sports stuff. I don't know a thing about that. Maybe that's invasive, but by and large, what we're doing, non-invasive, helping the community, and that principal just was thrilled to the point where I had to go, go meet them. So now, I'm only a few minutes off. Your professional development plan. Okay. Self-assess, develop goals, develop plan, execute the plan, evaluate a constant ongoing circle. And like with self-assessment, you had a feeding conference. You know, I, I learned in my early career, I worked with phenomenal OTs and speech people, and I could really do a feeding program. I'm not saying I could still do that, but I knew nothing about bracing. Well, you know, I developed some goals to learn more about feeding and I did a lot of feeding. I should have developed some goals about bracing. I didn't, I can't do it. Every time Kathy Martin talks about bracing, I, I'm like, wow, all this information that I don't have and I can't integrate and hopefully, and no one will ever ask me. And if they did, I'd refer onward. Um, but we have to see where our strengths and needs are and what, where we were evaluating. Fortunately, I'm not involved in bracing. So it's not a loss to me or the child. Um, we need feedback and mentoring. Who's mentoring whom? Um, so much self-learning going on in the field, and there are people that can really help you. Um, and here's an example from that document, Professional Development Plan for School-Based PTs. This is just one example. At this point, I have too much stuff up here, and I can't read the exact title, but it has to do with screening for, um, what is it, fit, fitness programs in schools. Wellness and prevention. prevention. Okay, wellness and prevention. And one, one of the competencies is implement a school-wide screening program. Okay, so you need some knowledge and skills and what they've then done, because of all those little things, uh, items on there, they've then gone, where can you go for this information? It's there, it's available for free. And then, you know, you list whether you've achieved it and then where's the evidence that you understand this? And again, this gets back to the, the COVID situation is what is out there? We don't have to invent it ourselves, it's there, but where can we get the data? Or, and that some of these references relate to that, the data relating to physical fitness and intellectual functioning, very strong, learning, very strong. Uh, review of fitness for children, and, and oh, no, that's not the one. Um, okay, review of physical activity and cognitive development. Um, there are important relationships, and that's what educators need to hear about, and that's our role to share that with them. So just, there's, this is an enormous document to go to, but very, very helpful with these active links. And we could certainly post it on today's talk, I'm, I'm assuming, um, but you could also go to the um, Academy for Pediatric Physical Therapy, go to fact sheets. Um, it, it's hidden under um, practice settings. It just doesn't say school-based, you have to find practice settings, and then you find school-based and you can find it. But a very, very useful document for those of you interested in actually two things, if you want your PCS and then, of course, for school practice. Um, I'd already asked all that. Okay, what methods can you use to achieve your, your roles? Performance appraisal, physical therapist performance appraisal. Well, there are professional measures. Uh, I used to always get graded in the schools in Atlanta, am I on time? That was the most important criteria. Well, that's nice, but I'm not gonna learn very much and go very far if the only thing I care about is I'm on time. School for the deaf, all he cared about is I used too many that's in my writing. I remember these things. These are, you know, okay, that. So I've stopped using that that often, I hope. Um, but nothing to, to advance me as a professional. Now, hopefully your system has more than that. And what has now come about related to starting with teachers and the education acts is teacher performance being based on student outcomes. It is being done in some states. It's not nationwide. I don't know about Oregon. I should have asked you. But it's still important because, you know, a surgeon, if a surgeon does his surgery 
professionally, 100% accurate to every measurement criteria, but his outpatient outcomes was 95% of his patients died. Okay, he performed his task appropriately, but 95% died, okay? Think of it in those terms. Yes, we have to be professional, we have to have standards, we have to do our job, but what about those outcomes? And think of that surgeon with all those deaths. Um, and how hard is it to get rid of that surgeon? We had a case, I don't wanna get particular, not a PT, but a pediatric surgeon who lost most of his pediatric cardiac patients. He did his job, he's very professional, but everyone died. You can't fire him. He did his job. His performance appraisals were good. When it became more public and it got into the news, thank goodness the surgeon left, but he's practicing pediatric cardiac surgery in another state. Not so good. So something to think about, and we're going to move on to that topic. Um, professional performance measures, evaluators must be able to provide sound determination regarding the PT's knowledge, skills, and practice. Not the OT's knowledge, skills, and practice, not the teacher's skills and practice, but what are you being evaluated based on your competencies? And that requires another PT. Now, it could be someone hired externally. It doesn't have to be an employee of the system if you don't have a hierarchy, but someone's got to look at your, your performance. Um, the competencies provide a framework, and then we have this professional development plan available at the fact sheet. Oops, no, cancel, I don't wanna do that. Okay, uh, student measures. It's gotta be grounded in the scope of physical therapy practice, must reflect accurately student growth addressed by the PT. But as our colleagues noted, it is really, it's an immeasurable thing when it's a team approach. Johnny is gonna to walk to the cafeteria independently with his walker in five minutes with his class. He achieves that goal. Did the PT achieve the goal? Did the teacher who was doing it every day achieve it? Was it the aid? It was the team. And so it's going to be really hard to tease out your performance based on what should be very participation-based goals. So it's just something that people are grappling with, you have to think about. Um, we have student learning objectives, skill objectives, participation objectives, um, test and measures, monitoring progress. And I wanna come down here to goal obtainment scaling and test and measures. And the PT count study, because it was a federally funded study, we had to use an objective measure. So we use a school function assessment. One of the problems with that test is it's a uh, judgment-based assessment, very good assessment. I'd advocate using it for all new therapists in schools because it tells you what's important in schools. But as a measurement outcome, the standard error of measurement is very large. So a student can make major clinical changes, major clinical changes, but it doesn't show up on that test as being so major. They just went up a point or two. So while it's a really good test to use to guide your planning, it's not such a good outcome measure. What we found in PT counts, we use goal obtainment scaling and goal obtainment scaling was wonderful. The children achieved their goals nationwide, a large, large percentage, a, a large percentage exceeded the goal because goal obtainment scaling that I'll talk about in a minute is multi-level. So it's it's very hard, this measurement issue. Um, if you know Car Carlo, uh, Carlo Belen, I'm saying his name wrong. He goes around the country doing tests and measures, uh, quick and easy, reliable and valid tests and measures that might be the the easiest thing for some of you to use, you know, the five minute walk and run tests, the sit and stand tests, the functional reach, all of those tests and measures are quick, easy, cheap, and reliable and valid, but not necessarily tied to function. So just something to, to think about. Here's an example of goal attainment scaling. Uh, zero is what you expect, two is where you're starting. And why not give the option of exceeding that goal? And that's what's useful about goal obtainment scaling. It's used across all of our disciplines. Um, the, the, the whole conference recently on goal obtainment scaling for in schools by teachers, by special ed teachers. So it's not something PTs would be unique and people wouldn't have heard of, um, but something to really consider using. And it's great for port, reporting on report cards. You can say what, what level they're at. 
um, student outcomes and your performance. Are the students achieving their goals? If achieved, were your skills required to achieve that goal? That walking to the cafeteria, were your skills required? Well, maybe initially, but then it's just practice, practice, practice. And we know practice, by the way evidence does support practice, is one of the most important things we can do. Or the goal was achieved, but the goal was too easy. That's the other problem we have. If you're a goal, you can write goals that are so easy, of course they achieve them. And that's a criticism of goals. Um, that's why in our study, we had to have all this validity done for goals because you don't want them too easy. You don't want them too hard. How do you get them matched? If not, why not? Were the changes in the student status? The student had COVID was out for two months. Student had surgery was gone. Did the resources change? There are school systems, unfortunately, in this country. When a PT leaves, they don't tell the parents. And it's only at the IEP meeting at the end of the year, the parents learn the child had no PT that year. Very, not very common. Common, however. Well, it doesn't say we have to tell them. There's nothing in the law that says we have to tell them. It was part of the IEP. It started, never occurred, and they don't hear about it till a year later. So what are the resources? Um, is your skill sufficient? Constraint-induced movement therapy. Um, I think most PTs can do it, but do you have enough skills to really do it and do it well? Um, do you have serious mobility problems yourself and you can't use gait trainers so the children in your classes don't have gait trainers? Okay, um, whatever. Uh, measures regarding student performance. Um, you have to remember there are regressive diseases. Um, did the child really have access to those services? Uh, reliability and validity, the outcome measures and the appropriate of the outcome measure selected for the student. If your salary, if your position is gonna depend on student performance, you have to really carefully consider all of these. And now our case study. And my case study is not some, I was gonna start with a really complex student. Um, and I may, when we get through this, so we have a minute or two, bring up that student that this was a case I was involved with a consultation last week. But- um, So there's some comments, there are comments in the uh, oh, chat, but okay. mostly mostly to do with caseload and uh, you know the delivery of services. And, and I think when you talk about things that are more general and MTSS, I I think that's probably uh, one of the barriers uh, to being able to jump in and implement uh, or move forward in some of these content areas. I'm wondering which content area you find the most challenges uh, in to move forward. Is it collaboration? Sometimes uh, because people are hired by different entities. Anyway, uh, Susan, um, someone says that they went to Hanneman and graduated in 1995 and that you were the staff that interviewed them. So a uh, trip down memory lane. Wow. Uh, <laughs> So uh, anyway, are there additional questions or comments before we move into uh, the case study application? Uh, I'll make a comment. I, I would just say a lot of what's being shared maybe has some overlap with other um, professionals in the school, like adaptive PE teachers, the school nurse. Um, a lot of the generalization is done when the therapist isn't there between sessions because the classroom staff and paraprofessionals and teachers have been trained. So, um, and, and a lot of the screening is not done by PTs at this point in time, simply because of uh, resource, you know, our time and numbers constraint. And even though there may be an abundance of PTs in the job market, in the marketplace, they are not coming to schools. <laughs> we are short. <laughs> Thank well, you. And that's across all therapy areas. I heard someone last week say they're down five uh, SLPs. So this is kind of statewide and probably beyond. Yeah, it, it depends on where you're at. But, but again, it gets back to having those students come into you for training and they want to come back. And so, you know, the best way of recruitment is always doing clinical affiliations with students. Um, it, you know, teachers have to go teach. We can go anywhere, but 
um, if once they've come into a school, they they tend to love it and really want to go back to those settings. Um, and and you know there are traveling PTs, and you know school systems could start thinking about that. Um, they need to start thinking about salary levels. I have no idea what it's like in Oregon, but but that is you go to the marketplace. Uh, is your DPT recognized as a doctoral level degree? Some states have gotten it to the doctoral level degree recognized. So they're at a level with teachers who go and get an EDD or a PhD. Um, so salary makes an issue. It is part of that, that issue of getting PTs. Um, but I think all too often we've been just happy taking on more cases or saying we can't do that. And I think that's a disservice to children. We were put in this law because there's a service we can provide and we need to provide it. Now that generalization goal, I completely agree. Other people are doing it, but maybe we need to be there to monitor it, to make sure it's going on. It's not some child you see every month. Maybe it's every semester in your school year. That's all. But to make sure someone's doing it and monitoring it. And once they generalize it, well, can we generalize it to other external settings? And that will require, you know, when you get to your IEP meeting, okay, Johnny learned to do this at school. Can he do it in the marketplace? Can he do it at home? Can he do it during extracurricular activities? How can we generalize even further? Because generalization is, you know, everywhere. And so is participation. We do not have participation-based goals, PT counts, almost none. Um, you know, and these are the best of the best therapists in the country volunteering for this year-long study, and even they didn't have much in the way of participation goals. So it's something we need to be looking at. And the whole thing about performance appraisal and student performance, it's complicated. There's, it's its going to be real complicated, And but it gets back to do you want to be... Um, your, your position depend on a student reading and writing, not reading, writing, uh, reading and math skills. You know, that that's really has nothing, very little to do with us. Uh, maybe if we work on the performance and endurance issues, maybe, but it's a stretch. Um, did I address some of those other common areas? Oh, oh, and workload. Oh. You know, our, OT, our um, speech colleagues have done a phenomenal job at, at the national level of getting workloads settled. And I don't know about Oregon, but I can tell you most states, there, there, there are standards for workload for speech. From OT and PT, not so much. We need to work on that. It should be a goal of the special interest group, the school-based special interest group. They did do the frequency intensity uh, work that's needed to get that, that information out. Um, it's something that, that really needs to be done and someone needs to be doing it. Like our speech colleagues, they've, they've set the standard and we just have to get there and we're not there nationally. And, and don't say, you know, um, well, someone else has to do it. Volunteer when the time comes, volunteer. Um, because we, this is a volunteer organization and this is how you get things changed. Um, and that, that's the role of advocacy. Um, but we need workload standards, uh, no question about it. And um, I never got to it, so someone else better. <laughs> um, so, so let's reflect on ourselves in the last 10 minutes here. Um, you know, where are you on the continuum? Now, someone graduated from Hahnemann in 95, so hopefully you're way up there and you're, you're in some sort of leadership role, even if it's not with an official title, but you're mentoring and nurturing other, other uh, therapists in the school. You're, you're taking students for affiliations. Um, and, and where are you? So all of us have some competency areas. Where do you need to go? Where do you see your personal gaps? And you have a training program and I assume Deb that you people submit ideas to you for topic areas. I was just typing in the chat box that what is it that we can do? What can RSOI do to support in those challenge areas, um, providing additional topics. Yes, we bring those to the table if we need to. Providing opportunities to talk to each other. Well, that's probably one of the most valuable pieces and share and uh, across the state. So what can we do to support you? Let us know. Yeah. 
because I, I know you're having a conference <laughs> in the spring. Um, yes. I'm assuming that 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 a SATCO is coming in. I'm assuming that someone recommended it, and you're you're doing that. We have had the SATCO here before, and we are bringing it back in the spring. Uh, everyone, I have uh, informally and now formally invited uh, Dr. Susan to join us at our conference in the spring. And uh, Oregon is lovely in April. Wouldn't you agree? All right. Well, that's a formal inf invitation. So, uh, and, and uh, yes, and even the babies are cheering. Thank you, Aaron. So, well, um, <laughs> you know, maybe you should say that after the avowal of this little presentation. <laughs> Well, I think the conversation itself and the things that you bring up are, are excellent points and areas for people to be looking at. I think some of the PTs attended the uh, quality indicators workshop, and there is some difference, of course, from different perspectives. Um, but I think everybody's looking at how to improve their services. And in, in, in a new era, uh, you know, things have to change uh, because uh, things have changed in our schools. We need to be part of the solutions. And how can we do that? So let us know how we can help. But people, Chris, I see you're unmuted. Feel free to share out. What is oh, it? Oh, I was need? just going to tell Susan, I think the presentation was awesome. And she could probably <laughs> even just give a whole hour of discussion on one or two of her slides that she was, you know, scrolling through. So, well, I'm hoping for somewhat of a workshop. Day. I'm hoping for some uh, something more of a full day in the spring and, and so people can consider those points and, and come away with some ideas. And um, Anna, would you like to, Anna Manenbach, would you like to unmute and, and say what you just typed in the, um, in the chat box? Yeah, I was just commenting to Joanne who was saying that SLP workloads are managed because most SLPs in schools pull out into small groups, whereas PTs push in. Um, I, in my role, I'm a um, program administrator for Jackson County Early Intervention, Early Childhood Special Education, um, but I'm also a PT, um, and so I get to wear that really unique hat of both administrator and service provider, um, but I just wanted to mention that ODE is actually pushing for uh, push-in services for SLPs as well, because when you pull a student out of their um, like community-based preschool or their their general education classroom for a small group, you're actually removing them from their least restrictive environment, unless it's maybe like half half students who are typically development developing and you know then the kids that you're working on the services with. So I would say I know for us we are seeing reduced numbers of kids in our speech groups. We're talking about how how do our speech groups look in the future? Do we have less of them because um, there really is this push to see kids in the community where they're at. Um, the challenge to that is that in Jackson County, my team of speech therapists, I have um, 16 SLPs and SLPAs, we serve over 50 community preschool sites. And so that caseload versus workload thing is very, very real to us because Jackson County is big um, and the staff gets spread thin pretty quickly. And then yet when you have more kids popping up on your caseload, you need, you can't say, Oh, we'll put you on the wait list. That's not an option. Um, and so that's really, you know, I spend many, many days, hours, nights, even thinking about how to manage these things. I want to comment on the uh, groups. I happen to really love groups. Done some research with Alyssa Laform Fist on groups and how successfully they can be for PT. Um, we don't use them enough, and it's a way as a service extender, because if you have a group of five kids, you have five kids you're now seeing in a set period of time, and that leaves time for other children. And be truthful, children need to rest. They, they need to model. There's lots of reason to do groups, and to your point of pull-out groups, well, make it an inclusive group. I mean, there's no reason most kids can't be doing some of the same activities. Um, but groups extend services. The thing is, we are not trained to work in groups. PTs are never trained to do group intervention. Um, my very first job in an, an adult rehab center, we did groups. I never knew groups. So I've been doing groups since the day I got out of PT school. And by the way, I'm also a special educator. I, I, my PhD is in special ed. So I can talk that language. Um, they do groups. That's what they do. And all of their data in special ed supports not one on one being more effective, groups of three being most effective. So even if you go back to the special ed literature, um, 
and they don't have tons of it either, but it, groups of three seem to be a really good number in special ed for learning uh, a good number of tasks. But um, I, I, I look at groups too. I, I we, we do a whole workshop series on group intervention because we're not trained to do it. And you know, it's not easy. Um, it takes some skill. So maybe that's one of your one of your areas of competencies, you know, working with groups. Go to those phys ed teachers. They're phenomenal in working with groups. I, I'm always amazed at how they get these kids doing what they're doing. When they're doing what they're doing, unfortunately, they have a lot of sit-down tasks. I, I'm involved in an adaptive dance program in the schools, and I see what, what's going on. But at any rate... But, but for yourself, how are you going to address these areas and how are you going to achieve those goals? And I guess that was what I was supposed to be covering today. Let me check. Yeah. Um, how can you address those goals? You have mentors. You have this statewide system, which is phenomenal. I think we're going to see a lot more online. Um, but there's also that networking. I know from innovations, meeting other therapists that have the exact same problems it's really reinforcing um, or the exact same issues with how do I get trained in that uh, at the advanced clinical practice conference, this workshop they do on um, orthotics. Oh my goodness. So mind opening. Um, how do you, how do you know you don't, what you don't know? And I guess that's another question for this list is how do we know what we don't know? Um, and do you have written goals? Do you write it down? You know, some people write career goals down. Uh, I'm glad I helped admit someone to Hahnemann's PT school there. Um, you had a written goal to go to school. Do you have written goals, you know, along the way? Um, any, any other questions, issues? This has gone quickly, so. Um, it has, and it's just scratching the surface, I believe. But that's why I think we really need you to come for a longer period of time. So um, it, we have another couple of minutes if there are any last minute questions or comments. Um, but I think we all need to dig into these and see where we are and see what the barriers are. Really do a self-assessment. Um, and uh, do you need to make a goal in all of those content areas? That might be hard. Take it easy on yourself. Start with baby steps. Pick one thing and um, move forward, the one that you really need uh, the most support with. And I'll say it again. What support do you need? How can we help you? When you get your survey for today, please let us know because we have our town halls. We have one on Monday. We can have additional conversations and we have lots of ways to bring this about. I see lots of heads shaking. Uh, this It was a wonderful presentation. And maybe it is a little bit of dry stuff, but it is the stuff that is needed, the discussions that are needed to help people to move forward. And um, if anyone has any additional comments, please do. But Susan, I am so grateful that you answered uh, my email and that your enthusiasm. She's been out of the country since then. I've been chasing her all around the world. Uh, but now she's back and, and most hopefully we are going to see more of you. Um, thank you. Big thank you. So we're going to take time to digest this information and uh, you will probably see us again. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. And um, hopefully it's been of some assistance and getting you thinking about your long-term plans and how you can really help those children you're serving. And PTs, thank you for all that you do. Yes, when you walk into the school, your role is probably often misunderstood. We're really trying to work on pieces to help our administrators and other folks in our schools to understand that. Um, but thank you for all that you do. Uh, you are respected uh, for the outcomes, and I am so thankful to be in the same boat with the PTs. I'm not a therapist, but I'm glad I know you all. I'm going to stop the recording.